Hello everyone, Charles Watts here, the Arsenal correspondent. Goal joining you on Thursday. We are edging closer to the big day, Boxing Day coming up. Of course, Christmas Day, I suppose. <laughs> Probably the big day around this time of year. But as Arsenal fans, Boxing Day, clearly a massive day in the football calendar. Finally, the Premier League is coming back. Arsenal can get back to action. Can they take advantage of that fantastic start to the season? They have enjoyed five points clear at the moment going into that game against West Ham. What a fantastic way to restart it would be if they could get all three points and just pick up where they left off before the break for the World Cup. Lots going on ahead of that game. I wanted to spend a lot of today's video talking about this interview that Mikel Arteta gave yesterday. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet or if you've recorded it and you're going to watch it later, then probably best just to log off this video not watch it because some spoilers about what he had to say but I thought there was lots of interesting points from Mikel really fascinating to see him sit down in that sort of um uh atmosphere he's different Mikel when you get to him in a press conference he's always on the defensive really kind of expecting and journalists to try and trip him up you can tell that he really really relaxes when he gets into a more one-on-one -on -one type atmosphere when it's not just all of us in a room bombarding him with questions you know trying to get lines for the papers that sort of thing and I thought he came across really well in an interview with Jamie Carragher on Monday Night Football yesterday he talked about a lot of stuff from tactics from the Arsenal rebuild project Pep Guardiola um lots of stuff and he and, and clearly a, a lot of the stuff was focused on Arsenal right now and the improvements that have been made and some of the decisions that he's um had to make he says look I put a plan in place of five different phases for the club where we are compared to the rest of the teams the timeline and everything we had to hit in every phase that's what he says about when he first arrived at the club when he sat down with everyone and said this is what we need to do over the next few years to get to close the gap on the likes of Manchester City on Liverpool and um Devin Carragher asked him are you sort of head or in line with that schedule right now and he said we are ahead I think look when he came in three years ago and uh where the state where Arsenal were after the end of Wenger the the way Emery turned out I think if you'd have said three years ago right now if one o'clock forward three years you're going to be sitting five points clear at the top of the term, Premier League table at Christmas he would have said <laughs> no chance I think we all would have done but that is the case so it's no surprise to see him say that they are um, they are ahead, and he spoke a lot of stuff like that about the relationship he's had with the um, the board members and the sort of project that's been put in place. He was then all, he was talking about his squad as well and how he's managed it over the first half of the season, how different that is going to be over the second half of the season once the Premier League returns and once every game is so vitally important. Of course, Arsenal have had to deal with European football for the first half of the season, but it's been the group stages. They haven't been against the strongest teams. That's going to change when the Europa League starts up again in March. And Mikel talked about that. I thought this was quite interesting. It kind of hinted at what could be to come in the January transfer window as well. He said um, when he was asked about not being able to rotate as much during the second half of the season as perhaps he was during that first part of it, he said that's something that obviously we are very aware of the type of game that we've had to play in Europe so far has allowed us to make a lot of changes and have a fresher squad for the weekend um, and then we've repeated the starting 11 a lot in the second half of the season I don't think that's going to be the same type of numbers we're going to be playing every three days the congestion and the amount of games that we have to play is going to be incredible and we're going to have to have more resources and more players to be able to do that now that's where I'm talking about you know this is kind of a hint of message almost is one of those Arteta messages that he always sends out in these interviews I've said it so many times before he's not the type of manager to to sort of toe the line and not say in interviews that he needs more he always says it he's always calling for more it's something he's always done since he's arrived and he says it again here he's basically saying look I've been able to rotate the squad I've been able to play the second string in Europe and not really have that impact me in the Premier League because I've still been able to play the same 11 pretty much every game give or take a few injury situations for the Premier League games that's not going to be the case when we're having to play every three games in the Premier League between now and the end of the season when the games the intensity the quality of opponents is going to be so much bigger we're going to need more players and more resources to be able to cope in the second half of the season if we want to stay where we are. That's basically the message. From me, reading that those comments, seeing what he had to say, that's the message I got from that. That was a very, uh, definitely a, a call for more, um, which we've seen lots of times for Arteta, and he's definitely saying there in those last things, and we're going to have to have more resources and more players to be able to do that. He's not the type of manager, Mikel Arteta, or the type of person who's 
just going to sit on his hands and be happy with what he's got. He's always going to want more. He's always going to be demanding. He's going to push the hierarchy for more. And that's what he's doing. And uh, I think it was a pretty obvious message, pretty clear message he sent out in those comments yesterday during that interview. And I'm not saying that either that the board, the hierarchy, are not going to back him in this because um, he's been over to America. They've had the big sort of sit down ahead of the January transfer window. We saw the pictures from LA when they were all together, Cronkies, Tim Lewis, Arteta, Redu. Um, and we know that they're interested in players like Mikhail and Mudrik. That's, you know, well documented now. So I, I do believe they'll back him in January. I think that'd be crazy if they don't. I don't know exactly to what extent they're going to back him. But, you know, I think they will try and do stuff. They're very aware of the position they're in. They know they've given themselves such a fantastic opportunity of doing something very special over the second half season, whether it be the title, whether it just be finally getting back into the Champions League, whatever sort of target you want to set or you think is realistic for Arsenal this season, they've got a great chance of achieving that this season. But you can't rest on your laurels because this second half of the season is going to be so intense, it will eat you up if you are not ready for it. So I think they've got to make sure that the squad is ready. And I think... I think they'll do it. I think they'll I think they'll try and back him. Whether that means they can actually get the players, we'll have to wait and see because there's one thing saying, look, we'll back you, we'll try and get the players, but then actually getting them is another thing because that depends on the player and it also depends on the selling club and how flexible they are going to be when it comes to negotiations. Will they drop a certain price? And I'm sort of thinking of Shakhtar and Mudrik on that because we know the sort of money that they're after or they're publicly they're saying they're after. But I think realistically, if they're going to, if they are going to sell him, they're going to have to accept less than that this, this January. So that was I thought those were really interesting comments from that about um, the rotation and about transfers. He talked a lot about the decision to give Martin Odegaard the captaincy, which I thought was interesting. He said it was difficult, especially with the history of the captain we've had in the last few years at a club. We had to pick one uh, and we had to surround that captain with other leadership skills that Granite has, that Gabriel Jesus has or Rob Holding has. Uh, but we believe that Martin represented really well where we are now as a club, what we're trying to build and the type of values that we want to instill at the club. Martin isn't the most vocal leader, but he leads by example and he is very well respected by everyone at the club. And he absolutely is. You know, everyone really respects Martin Odegaard. I thought it was interesting there that he included Rob Holding in that. And that's another little insight into just how important Rob Holding is in this squad. Gets a lot of grief, Rob Holding, which I absolutely think is totally unfair big time whenever if he plays he makes one little mistake he gets jumped upon i think rob holding is a really valuable member of this squad i think when he plays he does a really good job um but behind the scenes he's so so important he's so respected he's so well liked he's such a key figure in that changing room and having him around is so so important even if he doesn't play many games between now and the second half of the season which if everyone's fit he probably won't but he is still an integral part of that squad and um and i it doesn't surprise me at all that uh that Mikel name dropped him there because he is, he is vitally important. He also spoke about Pierre, the decision with Bamiang. Um, Jamie Carragher asked him about it and you know how big a decision it was. Jamie Carragher said that he really respected Arteta's decision. He didn't know if it was going to be the right decision, but he respected the fact that as a young manager, he'd made such a tough decision. And um, Mikel said, first of all, I didn't take that decision. We took that decision at the club. Obviously, there is my recommendation and what I feel that we need to do to get where we want, but I wouldn't like to single out any one player. I think it was several players. That's quite an interesting bit, I thought. He said, I think it was several players. It was part of the strategy of what we're trying to build. At the end of the day, when you're in a process and you want to go faster and there are people holding that boat back and putting weight on it, I'm sorry, but we want to go even faster and there's no time, whether it's a player, staff member, for someone damaging the club, we made that decision. Interesting stuff, I thought there. Not the first time he's really gone there with it. I thought not just the fact that he talked about Bamiang there, but he said there were several players. And we all know the big coal that he had, the players he let go, big name players that he let go, that he moved out of the club. Um, you know, big decisions that were made. And you have to look at how things have gone since. You have to say he was absolutely spot on and those decisions have been proved right. Elsewhere, aside from that interview, Arsenal played Luton yesterday in their final warm-up game, 0-0 at London Colney in that behind-closed-doors friendly. Saka played, Martinelli played, uh, and Ketia led the line. Still no goals. It's two games now about a goal for Arsenal. Not ideal going into the West Ham game. You wanted a lot of momentum going into that one. They seem to have started well with the Dubai training camp and the wins they had there, but then they've come back and it's just died down a little bit, that momentum. The Juventus game was a weird one. Dominated completely, ended up losing 2 0 to two own goals yesterday. I don't know if it'll be a worry to Arteta, but he would have wanted to win that game, no doubt about it. 
didn't happen. I mean, it was a strong side. Ramsdale, White, Holding, Gabriel, Cedric. Cedric played left back. Tierney wasn't there. No Zinchenko still. That's potentially a bit of a worry. Uh, Party, Xhaka, Odegaard, Saka, Martinelli and Inketia substitutes came on. Uh, Lino Sosa, Foran, Elneny, Lukonga, uh, Cozy Dubri came on, Vieira, Marquinhos, Kurjan. Um, so lots of changes in the second half, but Arteta would have wanted to get that team, uh, get that game one, I'm sure. Valuable minutes, no doubt. Great to see Saka and Martinelli back. That's a big, big boost. They'll certainly be starting against West Ham on Boxing Day, injuries permitting. Um, so good to have them back, but still, I think you'd rather win that game, wouldn't you, and go into the West Ham game on the back of a victory, even if it is in a behind closed doors friendly. Elsewhere, congratulations to Beth Mead. Fantastic win yesterday, winning BBC Sports Personality of the Year. What a year she's had. The Euros with runner-up in the Ballon d'Or. Maybe had a big shout to win the Ballon d'Or. A uh, whole host of awards are now BBC Sports Personality of the Year. Really great sort of acceptance speech she gave yesterday. Very teary, um, thanking her family, thanking the players who helped her with the Lionesses and saying it was a massive moment for women's sport and it is and it's just brilliant to see how women's sport women's football especially over here is continuing to grow led by the likes of Beth Mead and the absolute uh, legends who ended up winning the Euros uh, earlier on in the summer so that was great to see and also what has been great to see is it looks like Pablo Mari is going to make his return after that horrendous incident when he was stabbed in that horrible um, incident in Italy when some people unfortunately died when that Man went on a bit of a knife, well, on a horrible knife attack. And uh, Mary got stabbed, obviously, in the neck, had surgery. He's been out since then, but he has been called up for uh, Monza's friendly against, I wrote it down here, playing Leon, uh, so Alexander Lacazette. And that would be great to see Mary back in action. I mean, it could have been so much worse for him. Thankfully, he got through it relatively unscathed, and now he's going to be back within a, a couple of months of the incident happening. So great for him. Uh, and hopefully that all goes well and he uh, he can return to action and be back playing in Serie A as soon as it starts up again. All right, that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching. Anything you've agreed with, disagreed with, let me know, obviously, in the comments below. What did you think of Mikel's interview? Uh, did you enjoy it as much as I did? What were the big talking points? Let me know what you guys thought in the comments below. Until next time, everyone, have a very good day. I'll speak to you soon.